Now, let's just get started. I have a few quick questions for you, Raymond, and just want to get your feedback uh, on the recent announcement from the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. Where were you when you first heard the news uh, by the Supreme Court? So last Thursday, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its landmark decision on uh, the DACA program. I was actually on my way down to Florida with my girlfriend. She and I decided to take a much-needed vacation to Panama City Beach. And so we were in the car. I was driving, and my girlfriend was sitting right next to me. And like we've done uh, on many Mondays and Thursdays before the Supreme Court decision last Thursday, uh, we, uh, just before 10 a.m., logged onto our phones and, uh, and opened up what's called the SCOTUS blog. It's a live blog that, um, that a couple of law students, I believe, um, at a law school um, across the country, um, uses to publish their thoughts on the Supreme Court's activity for that particular day. So it's, it's oftentimes the first place people go when they're interested in uh, seeing what the Supreme Court is up to that day. So like we have done uh, in the months leading up to this decision, we opened up our phone, or my girlfriend did, I was driving, uh, and we saw that the Supreme Court had issued its only ruling for that day, and that it was a ruling on the DACA case. And so our hearts kind of sank. We felt like uh, th the time has finally come. We've been bracing ourselves for this day. Uh, we fully expected the U.S. Supreme Court to rule against DACA recipients like myself and like my girlfriend. And my girlfriend opened up the opinion and uh, skimmed it a little bit and got to a part uh, where the Supreme Court, through the Chief Justice, um, John Roberts, uh, listed their opinion. And my girlfriend read it out loud because I was driving and I'm never going to forget this moment because she was reading it and it said, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, the President of the United States did violate the Administrative Procedure Act in terminating the DACA program and therefore this decision is hereby vacated. And we had to read that three or four times before we understood, wow, we actually won. This was not the decision that we were expecting. Um, and so the rest of the drive down to Panama City Beach was um, was definitely a celebration. Wow, interesting. So the the decision was five to four with John Roberts, Chief Justice, siding on the DACA side. Were you surprised with Chief Justice uh, siding with that decision? I was definitely surprised that Chief Justice sided with DACA recipients on this issue. Um, uh, I believe John Roberts is a George Bush appointee, so he definitely le leans more conservative, conservatively. Uh, but earlier last week, the Supreme Court also issued a landmark decision in um, a decision that affects LGBTQ Americans. And so when that decision came out last Monday, I started to um, become more optimistic that the Supreme Court may side with DACA recipients on this issue. And so um, it was definitely surprising. Uh, it was a decision that we were not expecting as a community. In fact, we were bracing ourselves and we were preparing uh, to uh, basically provide services to DACA recipients who would be impacted negatively by the Supreme Court's decision. And so when the Supreme Court issued its positive decision, all of us advocates and organizers were kind of um, taken aback. We were at a loss. We were, um, I was on a planning call shortly after the Supreme Court's uh, decision. And we were talking about how tonight we were planning on providing a mental health expert to provide DACA recipients with the mental health services that they need following this decision. Um, and we, we still had the call with directly impacted individuals later on in the day, but um, the mental health expert that we had retained to be on this call with us um, 
was definitely not preparing to have this positive conversation with our DACA recipients and, um, and was indeed planning on uh, helping us cope with a negative decision. Mm, interesting. Well, I'm curious about um, your parents' feedback when you first shared news uh, with them about this DACA decision. Yes, yeah, so my parents were very excited um, when they when I shared with them that the Supreme Court sided with DACA recipients on this issue. Um, my parents were very fortunate in that in October of 2018, they were both able to get their uh, permanent residence through my little brother who in 2018, excuse me, turned 21 years old and was able to petition for my parents. Uh, so out of my entire family, I am the only one who is undocumented. Uh, I have two younger brothers who are U.S. citizens. My two parents are now permanent residents, although they were previously undocumented and they were previously uh, not protected by the DACA program like, like I am today. But by sharing this piece of good news with my parents, they, um, they were excited because for at least for the next two years or until the, the Trump administration attempts to wind down the program again, mm -hmm. I will remain protected from deportation as a DACA recipient now that the DACA program remains active. Mm -hmm. As you just say, the pres uh, President of the United States is still very adamant about striking out DACA and he's looking at all avenues and one of his avenues is this He's continuing to submit advanced papers to the Supreme Court. And what are your thoughts about that? Right. I think timing is, is a very big issue here. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone knows that Election Day is right around the corner in November. Um, and I'm not an expert on the Administrative Procedure Act by any means, um, but I do recognize that uh, to wind down a program like this, like the DACA program, in the correct and legal way, it takes some time. Um, my understanding is that the President of the United States or the agency has to file um, a notice in the Federal Register and, and provide people with the opportunity to provide some public comment on the issue. And so this is, um, this certainly takes time. Election Day is in November. Um, we are now just about uh, five or six months away uh, actually about five months away from the election. And so it'll be interesting to see if President Trump fulfills his, um, his ambition of winding down the DACA program before election day. What may end up happening, my personal opinion, is that if Donald Trump is reelected into the presidency, he may try again to, uh, to unwind the DACA program. But until that point, I am not confident that the president will um will try unless it's to appease his base um the overwhelming majority of americans i believe the latest public opinion poll shows that 91 percent of americans um, democrats republicans and independents support the daca program and support the 700,000 daca recipients here in the united states mm -hmm. and so if president trump were to fulfill his, um, his desire to end the DACA program, he would be going against 91% of Americans. And so I think that's definitely something to keep in mind, especially because we are in an election year. Interesting. So going forward, Raymond, um, what are the plans for all the DACA act activists out there uh, in, in, the, in the coming months or in the coming short months prior to the elections. Are, are you guys still going to continue to highlight the issues and, uh, and, and also perhaps, you know, provide support to whoever that needs help? Right. That's a really good question, Lee. And I think whenever I get this question, I always turn back to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, he is accredited with the phrase, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And uh, the reason I cite that quote is because um, the fight is not over yet. Uh, it's not even close to being over. DACA recipients across the country secured a major win last week when the Supreme Court decided to side with us on this issue. But the fact of the matter is, 
DACA has always been and will always be a temporary solution. It's a temporary band-aid on an issue that is a lot more prevalent um, in our society. The reality is there are 11 million undocumented immigrants that live here in the United States and only around 700,000 or so are, um, are DACA recipients. And in fact, about 175,000 DACA recipients themselves are Asian American. This means that about one in 10, um, uh, excuse me, 175,000, um, I'm getting my, uh, my statistics here uh, all wrongly, but uh, my point is there is a, a great percentage of undocumented people who are Asian American. And it's important for people in our community to recognize that this is an issue that affects all of us. Yes. And it's an issue that we have to continue advocating for. DACA recipients will not stop fighting until there is a permanent solution to the immigration issue in this country. And a permanent solution means a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented people who live here in this country, or at least um, a manner in which people can come forward and apply uh, for, um, for permanent residency and then for citizenship. I think one of the misconceptions that people have about the way our immigration system works is that it's easy to become a U.S. citizen, that you can just apply, that you pass the citizenship test, that you pay the fee, and that you can become a U.S. citizen in this country. But in reality, it's a lot more difficult. Our immigration system is complicated. I see it firsthand on a day-to-day -day basis as a DACA recipient, but also as an immigration paralegal at one of the most uh, leading immigration law firms in the country, Cook Baxter Immigration, based in Sandy Springs. Um, and I, the last thing I want to say about what comes next for DACA recipients is I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the current state of the world in which we're living. In, in which we're living, um, we are in the middle of one of the deadliest pandemics in U.S. history a pandemic that disproportionately affects people of color, whether it's Asian people, uh, Hispanic and Latino people, African Americans in our country, they are disproportionately affected by this pandemic. And, um, and we are also living amidst a racial crisis in our country, another racial crisis actually, where um, just a week and a half ago, uh, we saw the brutal murder of, of a 27-year-old black man in Atlanta at the hands of police. And the reality is, no matter where people fall on this issue of, um, of police violence, it's important for us to recognize the humanity in all people. Something is broken. And we, we need to address the way that we approach policing in this country. And as the majority the vast majority of DACA recipients and undocumented people in this country are people of color. We need to recognize that, that our liberation as a community is all tied together. We must all continue to fight with each other so that we can bring about the changes that we need in society. So even though we had this, this great decision in the Supreme Court last week for DACA recipients, I would urge all DACA recipients to continue to fight until we have immigration reform, until we have policing reform, and until we recognize that the pandemic is still here in our communities and we need to be working harder to fight it. Well, thank you for your, your feedback, your thoughts, and I uh, wish you the best of your endeavor and success at your work. And it looks like you're back to work tomorrow at, yes. uh, at the office. Back so, to work tomorrow after a vacation. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of cases waiting for you to, uh, to work on when you're back to the office. Certainly, lots of cases. But, um, but the rest of today, I'm just going to enjoy myself, relax a bit, um, so that I can be ready to hit the ground running tomorrow. Wow, great. Well, thanks, Raymond, as usual. Um, thanks for your insights, and uh, thanks for spending time with us. And uh, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. We'll talk soon. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.